Hello everyone, this is our service for the 21st of April. Welcome to our worship together. Now, just a wee heads up before we begin today, there won't be a service recorded by me next week, but you will be able to share in worship uh, recorded at each of our St. Andrews, St. Vigians and West Kirk worship centres. Uh, some of these will be live streamed as well, um, but will be available later in the day next Sunday. Let's turn then to worship the Lord together. In 1 Peter, we read, You are the chosen family, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's pray together. Lord God, you are always with us. Open our eyes to your glory and open our hearts to see your love so that we may rejoice in knowing you, joined together as your people. Amen. We sing together today our opening hymn, Love Divine, or Love's Excelling. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we praise you for the good news you have declared to the world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Your promise is unbreakable, your love everlasting. From the very beginning, you have been active among your people, rejoicing in truth, hearing their cries when troubled. You have guided us through days of peace and brought salvation in times of danger. Through the patriarchs and the days of slavery in Egypt, 
through the exodus to the promised land. During the exile and the return, you have been amongst your people. But your people have never cast off the sin by which they cut themselves off from you. Now in Jesus our Lord, you have called us back to your light, and the way is open to see the fullness of your grace. In him we are restored to your presence. The barrier is broken, and our eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit. May we celebrate the joy of that presence and the transforming power of the gospel Christ offers to us. And so we bring you our worship and our praise. And we join our prayers in the words of Jesus saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We turn to God's word in scripture. I'm reading first of all from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. The law was carved in letters on stone tablets, and God's glory appeared when it was given. Even though the brightness on Moses' face was fading, it was so strong that the people of Israel could not keep their eyes fixed on him. If the law, which brings death when it is in force, came with such glory, how much greater is the glory that belongs to the activity of the Spirit? The system which brings condemnation was glorious, but how much more glorious is the activity which brings salvation? We may say that because of the far brighter glory now, the glory that was so bright in the past is gone. For if there was glory in that which lasted for a while, how much more glory is there in that which lasts forever? Because we have this hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who had to put a veil over his face so that the people of Israel would not see the brightness fade and disappear. Their minds indeed were closed, and to this very day their minds are covered with the same veil as they read the books of the Old Covenant. The veil is removed only when a person is joined to Christ. Even today, whenever they read the law of Moses, the veil still covers their minds, but the veil is removed whenever someone turns to the Lord. Now the Lord in this passage is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is present, there is freedom. All of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces, and that same glory coming from the Lord, who is the Spirit, transforms us into his likeness in an ever greater degree of glory. And then from the Gospel according to Mark, from chapter 15, verses 33 to 39. At noon, the whole country was covered with darkness, which lasted for three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? Some of the people there heard him and said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. One of them ran up with a sponge soaked in cheap wine and put it on the end of a stick. Then he held it up to Jesus' lips and said, Wait, let us see if Elijah is coming to bring him down from the cross. With a loud cry, Jesus died. The curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The army officer who was standing there in the front of the cross saw how Jesus had died. This man was really the Son of God, he said. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now let us sing together and seek his spirit to open the scriptures to us. Look upon us, blessed Lord.
Let's pray. Gracious God, we seek the hope of the cross, for we realize to our shame that Jesus died not for his own sake, but for ours. Without him, we were lost, but through him, you restore within us the fullness of your glory. We are made in your image, yet we marred and spoiled all that you have given us. Now, though, you have made us clean, creating us to be your holy people. At one time, our lives reflected only the self-serving of childlike humanity. Now we reflect your glory by the Spirit which transforms us into your own likeness, called to display in our living and serving the marvelous acts of our wonderful God. Where we have been faithless in our prayer or have walked the path of selfishness, grant us forgiveness and renew us as your church that we may shape our lives according to the design of Jesus and with him shake the world. So may the words of my mouth and the thoughts dwelling in all our hearts be acceptable and worthy in your sight, O Lord, our strength and salvation. Amen. It's a little over 35 years now since Craig and Charlie Reed, known of course as the Proclaimers, sang their hit, I'm Gonna Be 500 Miles. The song, as I suspect you know, speaks of commitment. It's about the man who, who wants to wake up every day next to his beloved. The man who is going to be the one who is always there for her. He will always find joy with her. And to show his love and commitment, he says, I will walk 500 miles, then I will walk 500 more just to be the man who walks a thousand miles to fall down at your door. There's always been a part of me that wonders, well, what then? He falls down at her door. Does he make it inside? Imagine making such a physically demanding journey, taking perhaps, I don't know, a month or two, wearing through a couple of pairs of shoes, just to fall down at a door? And what if she's not even there when he gets there? To walk so far and then to be stuck outside, unable to move, well, that would be tragic. A tragic failure. Still worth doing as an act of love, but so near and yet so far. Have you ever done anything, something, and failed at the very last moment? How tragic that feels. And there have indeed been many magnificent almosts in history. Most of you may know that Hillary and Tensing were the first to climb Mount Everest in 1953. But did you know that Edward Norton, some 29 years earlier, had reached within 900 feet of the summit before turning back exhausted. So near, yet so far. And most of you may know that Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon in July 1969. But in May of that year, Apollo 10 went to the moon on a dry run. Everything was tested and the lunar module descended to within eight and a half miles of the moon's surface but they weren't allowed to land. So near and yet so far. You know, had things been a little different, the name of Thomas Stafford would be the one that we all know. But sadly for Stafford, he didn't even get to try that one small step. To get so far, to see your goal and then not be able to get over the threshold. It must be so, so frustrating. In the grand scheme of things, of course, such disappointments hardly matter, of course. But how much more tragic is it that human beings could never truly come before God? Certainly, Jesus said that we should be perfect, just as our Heavenly Father is perfect. But which of, one, which of us is perfect? We simply cannot be so. Actually, the word in Greek is teleos, which means something like 
brought to completion, fully accomplished, fully developed or complete. Paul uses the same word in his letter to the Corinthians when he says to the, the, that the Corinthians are like children, but they should seek to be grown up in their thinking. But who has achieved such maturity that we fully see others as God sees them and love others with the love that God has for them? The best that we can probably do is almost. We should try, of course, as an act of love, but we know we won't actually be able to do it. At least we cannot do it alone. Alone, we cannot reach God. Many over the years have tried. The ancient Babylonians built a tower in order that they could be like God. It didn't work. Others have tried in their own ways, and it's never worked. Not human endeavor, not human intelligence, not the wealth and power of kings, not even devotion or goodness or sincerity of worship has ever enabled people by their own efforts to achieve the perfection needed to come before God. And that truly is a tragedy for humanity that we might seek after God and then, at the very last, not finally be able to come before him. As Paul said to the Romans, all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. Now the Jews knew that only too well. They knew that no one can see the face of God and live. Moses on Mount Sinai could not see God's face and live, but the full glory of God was hidden from Moses and Moses could only see the Lord's back. Even then, he covered his face with a veil when he was with the people, for his face still reflected the Lord's dazzling light. Elijah, many years later on the same mountain, covered his face with his cloak to hide from the full glory of God. It was symbolic of the imperfection of humanity and the perfection of God. And the realization of all this was replicated in Jewish worship. The temple itself was separated into different areas. The court of the Gentiles, which was of course where Jesus had turned over the money tables, uh, the, the, the tables of the money changers. And then closer to the, to the altar, there was the court of the women, then the court of Israel, the court of the priests and the altar and there, there was the tabernacle. Protecting the tabernacle from the rest of the temple was a curtain. And there was another curtain separating this holy place from the holy of holies, where the high altar was to be found. The curtain represented the unapproachability of God. It was a way of protecting the people lest their imperfection be burned off and kill them in the process. The priests would continually enter the tabernacle to perform their rituals, but, but not even a great king or leader could enter the, enter the Holy of Holies, only the high priest. And then after being purified and then just one day a year could on the day of atonement go in to offer the blood sacrifice. But listen again to what happened to that curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the tabernacle on the day when Jesus died. The curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And it was this second of these curtains that was torn about uh, 10 meters high, huge, huge curtain, the one into the Holy of Holies. And this because of what God has done through Jesus. Through faith in him, anyone can now come directly before the God who loves them. At least anyone thinks that such a, a thing was achieved by uh, human endeavor. We're given this final little detail that the curtain was torn from top to bottom. Only God could have torn such a, a large curtain from the top. The tragedy of human separa humanity's separation from God had been removed by the tragedy and the victory of the cross. The curtain was torn, the barrier was removed, and now we can come within the veil. And it's this that changes everything. 
anyone can now come before God. We no longer need another high priest to go behind the curtain because we have a great high priest who has torn down the curtain. The complete sacrifice has been made and God has opened the way to himself through the death of his son. God has opened the door. The mountain has been summited. Humanity can make that one small step into another kingdom. We no longer need others to plead on our behalf to God, for we are priests. As Peter says, you are a royal priesthood. You are the chosen family, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvellous light. We are a royal priesthood. Now, the concept of a priesthood of all believers, that's certainly been important to uh, the Reformed churches. It still is in our churches today. Often, though, it's misunderstood as meaning little more than we all have a role to play. But for, put more fully, it means that every Christian has that right and opportunity to enter into the presence of God. Therefore, to be able to proclaim, to witness, to the Christian faith and has a corresponding calling to do so. And of course we do that and so much more. And this so much more is awesome. Through Christ Jesus, every Christian has di been given direct access to God, just like a priest. And that literally means that we are all priests. We have the right to come before God in person, not through any goodness, or any effort, or any deserving of our own. But because God has torn down the curtain, God has done it. God is equally accessible to every Christian, and every Christian has equal potential to minister for God. When Jesus died, God tore the barrier between us and himself. So now there is no being stuck outside the grace of God. There is no separation. And this is because of what God has done in Christ Jesus. We strive then to grow up to the fullness of what God calls us to be. Even though we still fall short, it's still worth doing. But God has, in effect, taken away the almost. God has opened the door. We can stand on top of the world. Humanity can make that one small step into another kingdom. And that's why we proclaim God's wonderful acts, because God has done it all in Christ Jesus. He truly is the Son of God. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Let's sing again.
Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for all your blessings and especially for the life on earth of your Son, Jesus Christ, who refused to avoid his destiny but chose to endure the cross and to glorify his Father in heaven. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave everything for us, dying that we might live. So we give thanks for the truth of the great paradox that he who loves his life shall lose it, but whoever loves his life for Christ Jesus' sake shall find it. Take us then to be your servants, Lord, and help us to know this truth in our living. May we follow the example of him who was lifted up on the cross, who was raised from the dead, and who is exalted to your right hand in glory. Make us steadfast in your service, Lord, and may our own lives be an example to others of your love for everyone. Almighty Father, as we pray for this troubled world, help us to discern your presence in it. We see war and conflict. We see hatred between nations and peoples. We see racial discrimination, and we are tempted to lose heart, but you never despair of humankind. We see sickness and suffering, anxiety and loneliness, fear and mourning, and the pain overwhelms us. But you share that pain and never draw back. We pray for those known to us who suffer through ill health and infirmity, especially those ill in hospital or unable to participate in the life of the community out with their home. May your healing hand be on them and your loving hand on their loved ones. And even as we ask your blessing for others, so we give you thanks for health and sustenance by your grace. Loving Father, we see so many people without a purpose. We see new gods taking your place and our courage fails us. But we know that your love is never deterred or outfaced. So Lord, give us eyes to see your work around us and in our hearts and use our prayers to transform the world by your everlasting love. Lord, as we celebrate your resurrection, strengthen your church to tell the good news to the whole world. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We go into the world with full confidence in the one who has opened life to us. Ye that know the Lord is gracious, praise and magnify the Lord. So we sing.
Once you belonged to no one. Now you are God's people. Go in the strength of his love to live and work to his praise and glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and keep you. To him be praise and glory forever.